get to Wembley, you know, you've got hours yet. I know, but it's not my best. I'm gonna get to the library, All right, see you later. later. Biotechnology, genetic engineering. What was it? A taste of things to come. Oh, oh Terry, I'm really sorry. No problem. I was thinking about something else. There's no damage. Look, I've got a dash. See you later, Rachel. Take care of yourself. Hi Brian, hi Steve. Um, watch this for a minute, will you? Sure. Anything on biotechnology? Living organisms? Rachel, welcome. Hello, hi. I'm pleased to meet you, but where am I and who are you? Oh, I'm just a good friend, come to help you out. Come and sit down, Rachel. My machine here will tell you everything you need to know. Now, biotechnology? How did you know? A taste of things to come, right? Yeah, that's it, exactly. This looks amazing. Just pass your hand over the octagons. Good. Amazing advances in biology have generated biotechnology, a technology which may allow us in the 21st century to make science fiction come true. Science fiction scenario number one. Biologists have started to decode human DNA, the message in all our cells that makes us. As a result, biotechnology may be able eventually to cure all hereditary diseases, Science fiction scenario number two. Growing healthy wheat requires tons and tons of fertilizer. That's largely because wheat is not able to get the nitrogen from the air it needs to grow. But some plants, like beans, can extract nitrogen from the air using little nodules on their roots that contain bacteria called rhizobia. If we could somehow transfer the ability to grow these nodules from beans to wheat or rice, the hungry developing world would be able to feed a lot more people. Science fiction scenario number three. DNA can be recovered from the remains of extinct species of animals with a view to one day bringing them back to life. The dinosaurs died out long before our ancestors appeared. A few optimists have claimed that biotechnology might be able to reconstruct creatures like Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops, making films like this one accurate for the first time. Hey, this is great, but I must tell you, I don't really know what biotechnology is or how it all works. Well, that's what we're here for, Rachel. This screen lets you select what you want to look at next. You have a number of choices. All right. Um, in the beginning? Good. Can I try enzymes? Of course. Just touch the key. This is great. This mouse has recently died. Let's look at what happens next, speed it up about 10,000 times. It's being attacked by scavengers like maggots. The really dramatic changes in the corpse are being caused by molecules called enzymes, which break up the basic stuff the mouse is made of. The enzymes in this case are made by the armies of invisible bacteria attacking the corpse, and also by the digestive systems of the maggots. Enzymes have been used by human beings in industry for thousands of years. This is bread. It rises because it's made with yeast, a minute single-celled organism. Enzymes break down starch in the flour to sugar, which the yeast digests, producing carbon dioxide gas. This gives the bread its characteristic bubbly texture. Cheese making also relies on enzymes. The first stage involves bacteria which make the milk curdle. Then an enzyme, renin, is added, which makes the curd solidify. Finally, Moulds are sometimes put in to give the cheese a gourmet flavour. These industrial techniques mimic things which go on in nature all the time. 
Biotechnology has been around for thousands of years of cheese, yogurt, beer and wine making. Today's biotechnology can do a lot more, but it still mostly does it with enzymes, creating some things that never even existed before, like cat milk. Most cats cannot digest lactose, the most abundant sugar in cow's milk. By using an enzyme which breaks lactose apart, the milk becomes digestible. That was really interesting. But the mouse, ugh. Hmm. So, what do you fancy next? Um, supermarket specials, I think. So, we've got chocolates, cheese, washing powders. Well, my mum loves chocolate, so... This production line makes soft-centred chocolates. The centres are made first. In the next stage, each centre is covered evenly all over with chocolate. They pass through a miniature chocolate waterfall. Finally, they cool and dry off. The secret of the whole process lies in the use of an enzyme. Here we make peppermint creams with very soft centers, except at the time of manufacture, they're very hard. They have to be hard to get them from their rubber molds, and also soft, sticky centers would be almost impossible to cover in chocolate. So, we mix the white center with an enzyme. And when we store them for a couple of days, the enzyme works on the sugar and softens them and produces a nice soft centre, which is how our customers like them. They keep talking about enzymes, but really I need to know what exactly enzymes are. Well, let's hit the key, need to know. There we are, Rachel. What next? I don't know. What about the cell? Although many of them look impressively solid, animals and plants are in fact collections of individual cells. Some organisms are made of just one cell. These are the bacteria and the yeasts. Others, like us, are made of billions of cells. Cells reproduce, that is, given the right circumstances, each cell will divide into two identical cells. The key to this process is a substance called DNA, which looks like tangled threads of string. The DNA contains instructions to make proteins, which are the basic ingredients and building blocks of cells. Some of these proteins are enzymes. Enzymes do the job of breaking molecules apart and sticking them together. Getting clearer now, Rachel? Yeah, but can I get back to the beginning? Sure. There you are. Great. Well, I've heard of Alexander Fleming, so let's try his famous fungus. Good choice. Until very recently, a scratch which went septic could spell death. In 1928, the medical researcher Alexander Fleming discovered a mould which killed bacteria. He called it penicillin. It was the world's first antibiotic. At first, it was very difficult to produce penicillin in the quantities that were required. The mould was grown on a nutrient broth in thousands of bottles and then laboriously scraped off by hand. Penicillin was urgently needed in hospitals to prevent wounds going septic. The bottle technique could never provide enough. This is the answer. It's called a fermenter. We pass air in at the base. The blades break the air into small bubbles and this allows us to grow microorganisms throughout the whole volume of the fermenter compared with just the surface. It's become the workhorse of our industry. And this is a modern production fermenter. It's twice the height of a house and it grows microorganisms to the weight of three of you every hour. Biotechnology seems to cover such a lot of different areas. Well, let's get back to need to know. There we are, Rachel. Definitions. Brilliant. Biotechnology is a technology based on living systems. It's been around for a long time. Many of our industries are based on it. For example, wine making and cheese making. They're based on biotechnology. 
The biotechnology field is rapidly expanding, so it's difficult to come up with a hard and fast definition because they're easily dated. Uh, all applications of biotechnology use biological material, uh, not just microorganisms. Who knows in future years what we may use uh, in the applications of biotechnology? So a good definition would be the use of organisms, enzymes, and biological systems for provisions of goods and services. That makes it simpler. It sort of links it all together. Oh, well, that's right. Mm, this looks important. World problems. Yes. You see, you have energy, agriculture, industry. No, let's see how green it is. Environment. As plastics are quite a recent invention, we have little idea how long they take to degrade away. A crisp packet may take up to 200 years, long outliving the person who ate the crisps. I'm standing here on a zoo of microorganisms, which in its way is every bit as diverse as the Brazilian rainforest. We've looked in nature, in these fields around here, for microorganisms that will make plastic for us. These microorganisms can make plastic much as we lay down fat, just for times of hardship, once we've been eating too much. And we found that the plastic that we can produce is very diverse. It can be made into, uh, for example, knives and forks, cotton wool, the whole range of articles that we use in everyday use. These materials also have one very unique property. In the right circumstances, they will totally and harmlessly degrade back to nature. So this bottle, which was like any other bottle, you can see has cracked and pitted. And that's because it's degrading and it will if put into the right environment, totally disappear. Bugs also come to the rescue of the environment when it's threatened by oil spills. It turns out that there are already naturally occurring microbes that can eat oil. Usually they're prevented from doing their stuff because they lack basic nutrients containing nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, slicks are sprayed with just these nutrients, allowing the bugs to do the rest. In theory, microbes could be used to eliminate many of the toxic compounds produced by industry, solving most of our environmental pollution problems. I think that's the best news yet, something really green. Well, yes, but I have to tell you that there are two sides to nearly everything. What do you mean? Well. Which of these? Oh, maybe this, genetic modification. This polystyrene chip is about the same shape as a bacterium, but it's about a million times bigger. Bacteria reproduce asexually. That means from this single individual, you get two identical copies, not like us at all. What's more, it produces those copies very, very fast. That means if I start with one single bacterium, just six or seven hours later, I end up with a million or two, like this. Now, if I break open a bacterium, I find masses of stringy stuff, like this, huge amounts of it. This is the DNA, and it's in a long loop. But if I look through that carefully, I'll be able to find a smaller loop like this. And this one, the bacterium doesn't really need. So let's suppose I have a piece of DNA from another organism. Let's say it's a gene for making a red dye, and I want to make lots of that dye. I take the loop of DNA from the bacterium, open it up, insert the new gene into it. You can do that with a gene from anywhere, because DNA is all the same. Put that back into a living bacterium, grow that up, and what I get this time is a mass of bacteria, all producing the same red dye. And that's it, genetic modification. So, what do you think of that possibility? It sounds so simple. I suppose you could apply that principle to all sorts of things. I think I'll try genetic solutions. There we are, another new menu. What do you fancy? Uh, bugs and drugs sounds most useful. Well, it's one way of interfering with nature. Some people don't like that. But every time we drink a cup of tea or your dog scratches his fleas, somebody's interfering with nature. Whatever we do, we're going to interfere. The question, I think, is are we going to interfere for good or for ill? Genetically modified bacteria are, by their nature, very, very unstable. So if you release them from the laboratory into the soil or into rivers or whatever, they'll just fall apart and die.
gene transfer is something that goes on all the time. It's not something that we've invented. For example, it happens every time sexual reproduction takes place. It's a natural event. There are far more beneficial aspects to biotechnology than harmful ones. Uh, the, you have to look into it in great detail to see the specific ethical problems associated with biotechnology. Human beings come in all different shapes and sizes. And for the most part, that's just normal genetic variation. But some children are abnormally short because they don't produce a substance called human growth hormone. These children need treatment with injections of growth hormone, and until 1985, this hormone had to be extracted from the pituitary glands of dead bodies. This meant that there wasn't enough to go round, and so we all had to have some system of rationing. With genetic modification, it became possible to get unlimited quantities of biosynthetic growth hormone. The other advantage of this synthetic hormone was that it was free of any possible contamination. Just because I was smaller than everyone else, the bigger kids used to beat me up. And now that I've been on growth hormone, they just treat me normal like everyone else. So people like Declan, who uh, came to us some years ago very short, can now have treatment, which is very safe and very easy. I've got a younger sister and she's three years younger than me. And she used to be taller than me, but now we we're just about the same height. Some parents of normal children are asking for the children to have growth hormone treatment in an attempt to make them even taller because they think this gives social advantages or helps them get a job or helps in sports. For example, in America, some tall children are able to get lucrative basketball scholarships. That's worrying. It seems like interfering with nature a bit too much. Well, let's get some help. You see a lot of talk uh, going on about this. Little children uh, who have pituitary gland problems need human growth hormone, and we've been successful in biotechnology by transferring the genes into bacteria so we can mass produce the compound. Okay, you've got a few idiots, basketball players, and people with cosmetic vein reasons who want to use the growth hormone. I think these are easily controlled, and I think it's a big problem, and it certainly shouldn't hamper progress made in the production of something as important as this. With any technology, there are issues of this sort. Um, what we have to do is to manage those issues by thinking them through at the early stages of the technology so we get the right balance of risks and benefits um, sorted out early on. You see, nobody's allowed to uh, do genetic modification in order to make all sorts of different types of human beings. We're not going to play with our genetic future. Uh, what people are allowed to do is to develop genetic uh, methods of creating medicines for people who have problems and dif deficiencies, including genetic deficiencies. Well, it comes down to how responsible people are. Well, that's right, Rachel. But have you thought about animals and plants? Hmm, good idea. On the farm? Most of the uses of genetic modification in agriculture have to do with breeding better kinds of plants. Plants have been genetically modified to live in drier environments, to resist pests, and to grow tastier fruit. Here, DNA is being loaded into the breech of a special gun. One way of putting foreign DNA into plant cells is literally to fire it in. This is the culture room, where genetically altered plant cells are grown and selected. The lucky ones will become the fruit and vegetables of the future. More people probably eat this fruit than any other in the world, but how many of them actually see it in this beautiful, ripe red state? More often, in the developed world, we see them like this. And that is because these tomatoes have to be transported from where they're grown, which is usually far away from the point of sale. So they're picked green like this, transported near the point of sale, then gassed with ethylene, and that gassing process then gives it a bit of colour and, and a bit of a change in, in texture. However, they taste of nothing at all. What we have done is used modern gene technology to stop the softening of the tomato so that we can allow the natural colour and flavour to develop on the vine. 
And we've done that using a technique of taking out the softening gene, turning it back to front, putting it back in the tomato, and this, in fact, is able to stop that particular softening gene working effectively. In that way, we have actually controlled the softening process in a tomato. This was an ordinary tomato. And this is a transgenic tomato. Exactly the same could be done for other fruit. For example, peaches, nectarines, and bananas. Altering the genes of farm animals is not new. Farmers have been selectively breeding them for hundreds of years. That's how varieties like these pigs came about, which were bred for bacon production. They're impressively different from their hairy ancestors, the wild boars. What biotechnology hopes to do now is to transfer genes directly from one animal to another. Genes for things like resistance to disease. These sheep have had a human gene inserted into them. As a result, they produce a human protein in their milk called factor IX, which is used to treat people with haemophilia. This makes factor IX much less expensive. Not only is this good for people, it's also good for the sheep, as they're extremely well looked after, and their milk is worth up to a thousand pounds a pint. So, Rachel, your time's nearly up. What's your last choice? Mm, well, it's got to be the human factor. As little as 10 years ago, working with DNA was very time consuming. Now, robots have started to take over from humans in laboratories, and all sorts of possibilities have opened up. Scientists all over the world are now collaborating on a huge program to decode the instructions on human DNA. This is the Human Genome Project. In this tube, I've got a sample of human DNA. DNA is a long molecule and it consists of a string of chemicals which give you the blueprint of an organism. That is the blueprint of a human being. This machine will make DNA. If you program it with the sequence of chemicals, it will string them together for you. So that in principle, you could actually recreate the blueprint for a dinosaur or a mouse. But to put that in perspective, the length of the molecule you have to have is absolutely astronomical. This machine will string together 50 or 100 of these chemicals quite readily. But to make the blueprint for man, you would have to string together 3,000 million of those chemicals. And simply to write those down on paper would fill the equivalent of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Each of the chemicals would be one of the, the letters on, on these pages. So what's biotechnology going to accomplish in the next century? A big disappointment for some, it's unlikely to bring back the dinosaurs. But it will be used to revolutionize agriculture and it's likely to create a revolution in medicine, too. In the next century, our genes will become open books. This means there's a risk to our privacy. But there's an enormous benefit, too. Many people have mistakes written into their DNA that give them genetic illnesses. Already, medicine has started to treat genetic disease by actually correcting the mistakes in the DNA. It's called cell therapy. In this kind of treatment, the cells are removed from the patient, are treated, and then the corrected cells are reintroduced into the patient. In the long run, this could lead to effective cures for many genetic diseases, and also for diseases such as cancer and heart disease. And in the future, it's possible that wards that were once full may eventually be empty. Brilliant, really fascinating. But I want to know more now. Hello? That was really excellent. 
Good night, Shoelos. Oh, there you go, crossing the road. Yeah.